Hello, booktube friends. It is Chelsea, the Writing Outlaw, here to do the second half of my uh, January wrap-up. We are rapidly, rapidly approaching February. Um, I wanted to start off this video with kind of like a little announcement -y type thing. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to switch up my posting schedule as much as I try to do and would love to do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Right now, with life stuff, that just doesn't seem to be happening nearly as often as I would like. So for now, I'm going to switch to just Monday, Fridays. And then if I get more time, or if it's a really good week for reading, or if something really big happens, obviously I will post more videos. But just so you know, just for now, uh, it is going to be... Hold on, I have to move this thing. Is that... Oh, look at how much better that lighting is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as for now, I will be doing a Monday, Friday video post. So look for me in your feeds at the to book end and start your week, guys. Whatever. <laughs> That's how it's going to be. Like I said, we are here today to do January wrap up. I only have a couple physical things to show you. So I'm going to go through the non-physical stuff first, obvi, since that's like the most boring. Well, not most boring, but less visually stimulating. Let's see. Uh, digitally, I didn't finish up like a whole, whole lot um, in terms of my ebook reading. I finished up uh, Clerk's World issue 112, which is the January issue. Uh, if you don't know, Clerk's World is a science fiction fantasy magazine that has new, new short stories and old short stories that are republished, as well as a couple of nonfiction pieces and some art. Um, I really, really enjoyed this one. I gave it like a three and a half out of five. Um, well, I mean, I guess on Goodreads, I gave it a three out of five since Goodreads still hasn't caught on with the half stars, but I gave it like a three and a half out of five. Some of the stories really, really landed well, and some of them really didn't. Um, this one seemed to be really heavy on the sci-fi. Uh, this particular issue seemed to be really heavy on the sci-fi, um, which is fine. But my favorite story was most definitely Old Paint by Megan Lindholm, who you guys may also have heard of as Robin Hobb. She's been floating around booktube quite a bit lately. So yeah, um, Old Paint is about a future in which cars have evolved and they're kind of these new, they're like self-driving, self-repairing, um, like new kind of technological innovations. And this family inherits, inherits this older car, which is much more like our, um, hybrid cars. Like the, the old cars in this story run on both electricity and gas. Um, and they have like GPS systems and you can program like voice response activation, but they can't drive themselves or it can't drive itself. And so at the time, you know, this is like some beat up old clunker and it's kind of the story about how this family falls in love with this car and then all of the um, auto programming in the new cars rebels. And so cars start crashing into each other. They start like literally attacking people. It's kind of like Christine, um, the Stephen King novel, but obviously much shorter. <laughs> um, and it's about the family and dealing with that and dealing with old paint, which is what they call this old car. And I never actually thought I'd get a little uh, misty-eyed at a story about a car, but I did. So if you can find old paint online, or if you, I'll see if I, I'll see if I can find it, and if I can, I'll link it down below. If not, it may be worth picking up the most recent issue of Clerks World just for that. <laughs> just for that alone. Um, other than that, on audiobook, I finished Going Clear, um, Hollywood Scientology and the Prison of Belief. I got the subtitle right this time. Uh, this is by Lawrence Wright. It is an audiobook expose about Scientology and with the foundations of Scientology and where Scientology is now. I absolutely loved it. I've seen the movie, so it was no surprise that I was going to love it, but I found the book equally fascinating and, of course, much more detailed. Um, I also really enjoyed the narrator, so if you're looking for a nice bit of juicy nonfiction and you kind of have, like, a thing for, um, like, obscure religions or bee religions or cults or whatever you want to call it, uh, definitely check that one out. By the time this video goes up, I will have also finished um, the audiobook of Cress, which is the third book in the Lunar Chronicle series. And hopefully I'll be moving on to winter before too much longer. I think listening to this on audio was the key for me because I tried reading it in paper and I just didn't love it, which I think is a combination of both reading it in print and also the fact that I didn't really like Scarlet. Like I really liked Cinder and then didn't really like Scarlet. So I kind of had like a bad taste in my mouth and just wasn't like the story took a little too long to pick up. So I just kind of wasn't having it, but I really enjoyed it this time around. I really enjoyed listening to it on audiobook. I checked that out for my library and I'm currently on hold for the audiobook for winter. So hopefully that pops up sometime before too much longer. I am planning on buddy reading that with, um, Caitlin from Kitty G and possibly Elena from Elena Reads. 
maybe? I don't know if she's quite signed on to join us yet. Um, other than that, in these last couple of weeks, I have finished one graphic novel that I had to return to the library, and that is Chu Volume 10, Blood Pudding. Um, this is my favorite novel of Chu, like, so far. This is, as of now, the last issue. I'm not sure if there's going to be an issue 11. Um, issue 10 definitely wrapped up some of the major storylines, and... If you follow me on Twitter, you will see that I tweeted, a, like, last week when I was reading it, there is a little shout-out from John Lehman and Rob Guillory, who write Chu, to Kelly Sue DeConnick and Valentine Delandro, who write Bitch Planet. One of the characters in Chu is wearing a non-compliant t-shirt, which is, if you've read Bitch Planet, like, that's the label that they put on women who are defiant is not compliant. And so I was like, hell yeah, like I love little insider stuff like that. And especially in comics, I just thought it was super cool. So if you've not checked out Chew yet, obviously do not start with volume 10. <laughs> Go back to volume one, start with Taster's Choice. You will not regret it. This is probably one of my all time favorite graphic novel series. It is the funniest graphic novel series I've ever read. And it's one of the few graphic novel series I'm hoping to own because it's one of those graphic novels that like in the ephemera, like in the background, of the scene or in just like the the kind of setting that they're in there are so many little hilarious tiny details um the, it's really really hard to get them all in the first pass so i'm really excited to go back through and reread them all like in one fell swoop and yeah i really really enjoyed volume 10 so definitely check it out and then lastly i read two physical books or finished two physical books uh, the first one was Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. I gave this a three stars on Goodreads. I liked this book. I didn't love this book, but it was a fun little adventure heist story of like outcast, um, like thieves. It was kind of like a poorly written YA version of The Lies of Locke Lamora. Um, if you're really just looking for a heist novel, I would pick up The Lies of Locke Lamora. Um, but if you're looking for YA and you really liked Lee Bardugo's Grisha trilogy, I would definitely pick this up. The world of the Grishas is more downplayed in this book. There's not necessarily a whole lot of world building. Um, you can go into this one without having read the first trilogy. I did, and I understood everything, and I got it, but I do feel like maybe there's a piece of the puzzle I was missing, and I didn't even know I was missing it, because... Yeah, I didn't read the first trilogy. But like I said, it's fun. There are plenty of twists and turns. There were lots of moments when I found myself, like, reading it and being like, yeah! Like, throwing up the victory fist on behalf of our cast of main characters. Lee Bardugo does some really interesting things with gender and sexuality, um, both with her two female main characters and also with a pair of her male main characters. There's a lot of really good, um, well, not really, there's a lot of okay um, attempts to handle, like, physical diversity and... Um, like spiritual diversity and eth ethnic diversity and all of these different things. So definitely um, were some good attempts made by Lee Bardugo. I felt like she maybe didn't handle them either as fully or as well as I would have liked to see her to. But yeah, I really enjoyed that one. And that leaves us with the last book I read this month, which was one of the few five-star reads I've had so far in 2015. And that is The Girl Who Slept With God by Val Berlinski. I am reading this, or Buddy reading this with um, Brittany from Under the Radar Book. She's about halfway done. Maybe a more than that. Last time she and I talked, she was about halfway done. And I loved this book. I said in my Goodreads review that it reminded me a lot of The Virgin Suicides, which it does, but I actually like this one more. The I will say that the thing that kind of perked my interest and got me into this book was the idea that... Um, Okay, let me back up and explain what this book is about. This book is about Grace, who um, is from a family of like a very, very devout religious family and she goes away on a mission trip to Mexico and she comes back pregnant and she swears that it is God's baby, that she has been given an angel baby from God. And so her father kind of doesn't really know what to do with it. So he takes Grace and Jordy to this other house that he owns kind of out in the country and just kind of leaves them in an attempt to both protect his daughter, in his mind, protect his daughters from ridicule and also to keep the town kind of from finding out about Grace and her unfortunate situation. Um, that part about Grace saying that the baby is God's on the flat plays a much bigger deal than it does in the book. The thing that I actually love the most about this book is the um, interconnected relationship between Jordy, Grace, and Grip, who is the man who drives the ice cream wagon, who kind of befriends the girls and becomes entwined in their lives. And there's this really great kind of tension between Jordy and Grip. Um, and it's a book about first loves and last loves and what to do with a family who doesn't understand you and how do you define your faith and your religion. Definitely, definitely, definitely worth picking up. It's not super long and I'm really, really excited because I'm pretty sure I'm going to order a copy of this to have for myself in case I ever want to reread it. All right, guys, and in 10 minutes or less, we have wrapped up the last two weeks of January. Let me know down below if you've read any of these 
or if you're planning on reading any of these, if you have any great recommendations on stuff to read based on these. Um, and as always, you can like, subscribe, and I will see you guys around the internet. Bye.